against the advice of everybody who lived there. You know, they said, don't live there. <laughs> There's all kinds of mosquitoes. You'll right. get malaria, which I think is what probably did him in. He had a club foot or something, too. He had yeah, some kind of uh, deformity on one of his feet. So he's an overachiever. And so he was like Drabinsky. He yeah, right. compensated by uh, doing about 10 times what most people do. He had some. He he helped out a lot of uh, aspiring writers by reading their work and giving them critiques. And there was one guy who apparently was very prolific, but not so hot. And Byron kept writing Byron. What do you think of this? And what do you think of that that I sent you? And he Byron finally wrote him and said, "I'm really in theater history." And they all concentrated on Manitoba theater, saying, "Wow, I got so many theses to look at." <laughs> I felt like charging a fee. <laughs> yes, I will read your thesis, and yes, it will cost you $200. Where did you go? Ça va? Yeah, no, we're wrong. I haven't broken the lens yet. No. Let's start off very generally now. It's very difficult to get away from the Manitoba Theater Center. What was it about this uh, Manitoba Theater Center that was such a phenomenon that has gotten it in all of the, uh, all of the books on Canadian theater? Well, I think it was because uh, uh, we were very lucky in having John Hirsch as our artistic director. He was a sort of driven person with uh, a lot to be driven about because of his history during the war and losing his whole family at Auschwitz and things like that. And uh, I think he felt he had to somehow or other assert the fact that he was alive somewhere and this was one way to do it. So he had an infinity of, of ideas of things that he wanted to do, plus he was very, very good at taking ideas from the rest of us if we thought something or other should happen. And the result was that rather than trying to be simply a theater putting on plays, which is enough for most people, we felt that we should have a school for the audience, that we should take in students you know, and teach them how to appreciate plays. And we were lucky because we had you know, people like Bill Hutt and whatnot coming out, so Caldwell. And they would lecture our, the kids who were in our school. Uh, we felt that we should tour, and we toured all over Manitoba and parts of Saskatchewan. Uh, we, uh, felt that we should do something about encouraging uh, new writing. So we did new works. We made a second theater in a warehouse. And uh, we had plays by people like Jack O'Field, who later on became a big documentary maker in Vietnam. And uh, uh, Betty Jane uh, Wiley did early work by her. Uh, I can't think of Adrian Pecknold, a lot of people started out there, Martin Lager, who became quite a well-known writer on television. And I myself wrote for the theater there, and, and John as well. So we, uh, you know, we, we had a whole range of activities because you have to remember that when we began the theater, there was nothing professional at all in Winnipeg. There was a, a amateur theater, the Winnipeg Little Theater, which had been there since 1922. And there was the CBC, and that was about it. Uh, the French had, uh, in St. Boniface, had a very high quality uh, amateur theater called the Cirque Molière. And we admired them and envied them because they had such style and the actors were certainly uh, professional quality. So when we began the precursor theater to Manitoba Theater Center, we brought in the, uh, the Cirque Molière and they, they took half the parts in our very first production, which was the, uh, the Italian straw hat. And uh, I think that uh, our aim was to create a, a welcoming atmosphere and an outreach atmosphere to do a lot of things that could be relevant to a lot of people. And this was very unusual because most theaters about all they did was do their best to put on good plays, market them well, and somehow or other come out on the right side of the, uh, the balance sheet. You have to remember that when we began, the Canada Council was not yet in business, and we were in business mm, as Manitoba Theatre Centre at least two years before we got any money. I couldn't believe that we were going to get any money from somebody for doing what we wanted to do anyway, but uh, they eventually did. 
start giving us money. Uh, it had also, uh, we were fortunate because uh, there was a very influential critic here in Toronto at that time uh, named Nathan Cohen, who was a very acerbic, tough man who seemed, he, he did not like anything, everybody said. Uh, he hated Stratford, he hated the Crest Theatre here in Toronto. Uh, and in any event, he announced to us in Winnipeg in around 1962 that he was going to come out and take a look at our program because he'd been hearing from different actors and directors about this theatre in Winnipeg that was all full of beans, you know. So uh, he came out and uh, he loved everything we were doing. He wrote three articles for the Toronto Star, which was then the paper to be in. Uh, as opposed to Globe Mail, let's say, and uh, praised us to the skies. So right away our reputation was made right across the country. I think in some ways he did it in revenge against Stratford and, uh, and, uh, and the Crest, but he certainly said we were the best theater in the country and everybody should come and take a look at us and see how we did it and try and do as well. Can I establish a timeline? Like, when did the Manitoba Theatre Center start? Oh. And in what building, and who was in that building before it began? Uh, we began a year before the Theatre Center was established, a theatre called Theatre 77. And that was in 1957. Why it happened then was because the uh, Dominion Theatre, which was an old, uh, I guess it was an old vaudeville house, uh, built around 1905, 1910. It was a shoebox theater with very, very good acoustics, no backstage to speak of, but uh, very good sight lines, very good seating with a balcony and, and a main floor. I guess it was about 450 down, about 350 up. So it was a, a nice size, you know. Uh, you could accommodate a good sized audience with a week or two week run. And when it uh, suddenly became available, what happened was that, uh, I think it's now come to knowledge, that uh, uh, Miss Richardson out there uh, uh, from the uh, Richardson family bought it and made it available to the little theater. Uh, we rented it. We thought, ah, here's our chance, because we'd been wanting to start a theater for a while, John and I. So we pooled our savings, we got the, a lease on the theater to do five, four, five productions, and we did. And in our first year, we played to a lot more people than the little theater did. So at the end of that year, they asked us to come and work for them, and we said no, but we will kill our group if you'll agree to kill off your group, and we make this uh, amalgamation to be called the Manitoba Theater Center. Uh, we got that name from uh, France, actually. There was a theater in uh, Lyon, I think, which was called a Centre du Théâtre, you know, Ville Urbaine. And uh, so we wanted to establish that it was something different than merely the theater, although well, being a theater is, is quite enough things for me. Uh, in 1958, in the summer, we made a deal that we would have two series, one uh, called the Little Theater Series, one called the Theater 77 Series. Our theater was called Theater 77. And that if the trial marriage worked out, then after a year we would get rid of the, the two. The Little Theater Series was not paid. It was an uh, amateur like the Little Theater, and the uh, Theater 77 Series was paid like Theater 77 had been. So the actors resented bitterly that if they were in one set of plays they were getting paid <laughs> and in the other set of plays the same actors uh, weren't getting paid and they were very happy to see that trial period come to an end. Uh, I worked there until 1963, the summer of 1963. John stayed on for a couple more years and at that time I had been offered a uh, a uh, senior arts award by the Canada Council to go and make a study of uh, uh, support systems for uh, for the performing arts in the States, in Britain, in Europe, and in Eastern Europe. 
So at that point, I took up that offer, and Judith and I went to uh, oh, all over the place to see what they did to uh, strengthen you know, the network of, of performing arts organizations in these countries. Uh, the reason why the council was interested in having that done was because the centennial was coming up and the arts were supposed to play quite a prominent part in it and a lot of the organizations were pretty shaky, you know, because the main energy had gone into uh, the uh, artistic production and a lot of the management side had, had been neglected. So they were very interested that somebody should come along and be able to help out in that area. I came back then from uh, the year, and uh, Judith and I worked briefly at uh, Canadian Players, which was a touring company that uh, was based here in Toronto and which was having one of its periodic crises. I worked there only, well, we were there only about six months because they didn't have an artistic director, so I arranged for uh, Gene Roberts and uh, Marigold Ch uh, Charlesworth, who worked as a team. They'd been at the Red Barn, and they had the, a theater down at the, uh, the library here in Toronto, Central Library. Very high quality people. They came in, and they took over from me. And at that point, then, uh, the Centennial Commission and the Canada Council, as agreed, set me up in business as the Canadian Theatre Centre. Uh, Jean-Louis Roux was the president, uh, an actor, director, writer from Montreal. And uh, then we went into business as consultants to the performing arts generally, starting with the theatre across the country. And our first big effort was uh, to get in, I had met during my year uh, quite a brilliant subscription salesman named Danny Newman from Chicago. So uh, I got the Ford Foundation to lend him to us for part of the year. And we sent him around then to all the different theaters and got them to kind of take an oath in blood that they would do what he said to do. And a lot of them, later on, when I was leaving the center to go to Stratford in 69, uh, wrote and said if it hadn't been for that subscription effort, they wouldn't be in business for sure. Uh, we also advised Canada Council on what was necessary in the way of funding to be able, you know, not to just throw money at the problem, but to strengthen things so that there would be a national ballet and a Canadian opera company and all these other things around when 67 came and, and more important, would still be there afterwards. Did you personally think, did you import any of the uh, the look or uh, of the Stratford Crest or the Théâtre Nouveau Monde? Did, did it have any bearing on the philosophy of the newly emerging at the theater center? No. Uh, in fact, we, uh, we uh, had a, to begin with, uh, we did plays uh, which were chosen. In the case of the Italian straw hat, we did it because we wanted to be able to involve the Sermonier. They had done it in French as the Chapeau de Pays d'Italie, and uh, which wasn't a good idea to do a play because John's heart wasn't really in the production. And I found out he only did a really good job if it was something he was ready to die for. So, well, then when we hooked up with the Little Theater, as part of the deal, we had to agree to at least explore using their formula, which was, you know, a mystery play a Broadway comedy, some kind of a classic, and then what you will, the fourth play. And again, that didn't work because we were putting on a lot of stuff just to fill up the schedule. So finally, I, I said to Johnny, look, you know, I did not give up my Bentley and my Jaguar and my accounting career to produce this kind of crap. So either we start doing only plays that you are ready to die for, or you are going to have to get a new manager. Well, it just so happened he was feeling exactly the same way. So we adop adopted then a very different kind of a, uh, an attitude toward uh, uh, repertoire than the Crest or Stratford. Stratford was constrained because they were Shakespearean. And the Crest, I think, to a great extent, they had a similar kind of outlook, whatever Murray Davis liked or Donald Davis liked, depending on who was running it went into the repertoire, but they also tried to second guess, you know, what was going to be popular. 
And uh, for us, that just didn't work. It was easier for me to sell something that John had produced the ass off, you know, because he loved it, than to try and sell something whose only asset was it had a big name or people had heard of it. We, we really uh, founded our success in, um, in Winnipeg, he and I, on a, a really groundbreaking production of Arthur Miller's play, Death of a Salesman, uh, which was considered to be a very difficult play to do and a real downer in terms of trying to get an audience. But what we wanted was a play that John personally felt a lot of uh, affection for and that would be uh, something that the, uh, above all, uh, the Jewish audience in Winnipeg could come and have a look at because they were people, the theater goers among them, who customarily went to Chicago or New York to see theater. They did not go to theater in Winnipeg. And uh, so we put on this production using all local people, and it was, if I say so myself, it was terrific. Uh, in fact, people were buying our tickets and scalping them. This had never happened in Winnipeg. <laughs> our $1.75 ticket was getting five bucks out on the street. I was thrilled when I heard that. I put it in the paper right away. Uh, so that's, that really persuaded people that high quality material could be seen there. Up till then, the only high quality uh, Canadian material that had been seen in, in Winnipeg was intermittently the little theater. There were certain directors like Margaret Stobie and, uh, and John who directed for them, John Hirsch. And usually when they did shows, they were pretty good because they knew their stuff, those people. But a lot of them were. And the only really good, uh, uh, inspiring Canadian theater I ever saw in Winnipeg was uh, uh, the Canadian players when they first came out. Bruno Gerussi and, uh, and Dougie Campbell, Franny Highland. And I forget who else was in. I guess uh, Dougie's wife. Uh, so I've forgotten her name now. But uh, they were sensational. They did a four-person St. Joan, and I couldn't believe that, that something produced in Canada could be that good. That's really what decided me that, uh, that theater was worth uh, taking a hand uh, in at, at that time. And uh, later on, Dougie Campbell came out and certainly helped us out, came out and gave speeches, and as did Tyrone Guthrie from, uh, from Stratford. There was, you know, a constant uh, give and take from all these people because the profession was very small. But uh, we had to find a way of doing things that suited Winnipeg more than anything else, you know, and, uh, and suited the resources we had in the way of an acting community, and then as resources grew, in, in, in the way of people we could get to, uh, to come in from Toronto or from Vancouver to uh, augment what was available. Well, even this very day, you get all kinds of stuff. Uh, this movie star just played in, in Winnipeg. Um, it's been going, going so right for so long. How do you explain that? Do you just do it right in the first place? You, you fly by the seat of your pants using your gut instinct, or what exactly? Well, uh, I tell you what my uh, motto was in those days. <laughs> Our official motto for, th motto for Theater 77 when we founded it was the uh, Theater 77, the only professional theater between Toronto and Yokohama. Because if you drew a line, there was nothing west of us at all. And, uh, but you see, up till then, uh, the uh, Canadian theater with Canadian actors and usually Canadian scripts was the CBC radio. And I remember saying to John, if we could have a theater that people would wait to see the way they wait to hear the radio drama every week. It was very, very high quality in the 40s, and early 50s. Uh, then we'd be all right, you know. And they're doing it because CBC is always doing stuff that these people really want to do. So it, it was kind of natural to go the route we went, you know, to sell what we thought we could do a good job on rather than to try and do a job on what looked saleable. Very nice. Uh, the opening night, 
half Lorraine. Not a bad budget. Roger Planchon. You can throw these together and give me an idea of what that opening uh, night was all about. What it was like, what it felt like for you, and what was it a summation of? When we started? Well, we had two opening nights. Uh, the opening night of uh, Theater 77, it was in, I guess it was in late September or October of 1957. And we got a telegram from the Queen, and I stuck it up on the board, you know, along with all the other telegrams, because I just assumed everybody got telegrams from the Queen when they all done shot. Gee, the little theater never showed us the telegrams before. Uh, but then afterwards, uh, somebody said, gee, you got a telegram from the Queen. Uh, who arranged that? I, I don't know. Uh, I thought they just did that. You know, it's like when you're 100, you get a letter from somebody. But uh, it was all very exciting, and there was a lot of uh, a lot of fear. At that opening night, we had a party, and boy, it was a really contentious party. It put me off going to theater parties for years afterwards, uh, because what happened was that the st we threatened the status quo in Winnipeg a lot. Up till then, people got status as actors by having big parts in amateur plays. And then here we came along, and one of the big things you had to have going for you was availability. You had to be ready to rehearse yay many hours per day and get paid for it. And you had to be on time, do all the things that nobody ever did in amateur theater. And uh, that was very scary for a lot of people. A lot of there were public meetings denouncing us for uh, corrupting, you know, the purity of uh, artists by wanting to pay them to do things that they wanted to do for free. Well, it was crazy because we were all working like mad on CBC for whatever we could get from them. Uh, and that was the only paid work in the country at that point. The opening night of the Manitoba Theater Center was uh, a uh, hat full of rain. Cordy Pinson played the lead. He had played a butler in an Italian straw hat. And his big moment on stage was somebody spat in his face. And I remember he reacted very well to this happening. It was, it was in the script. And uh, then for a hat full of rain, he really, he, there's a guy who really works on whatever he's doing and has always stayed that way. But he went out and he went and, and studied people who had big drug problems and everything and found out all the physical things of withdrawal and whatnot. Well, on opening night, people were not prepared for all this stuff, you know. For, it was kind of New York realism. Um, it, people were fainting. They came out in the lobby and threw up and fainted. I mean, it was very scary indeed because nobody had seen, it was like method acting, you know, carried as far as you can take it without just plain living the part. Gordy was sensational and it was a, a great start for the theater because everybody was talking about <laughs> go to the Manitoba Theater Center and get sick. <laughs> it was a, a, a lovely way to, to begin. And, uh, and in it we were able to use a lot of the people that we'd worked with uh, at Rainbow Stage and, uh, at, uh, and in, in the little theater, you know, uh, so that uh, it was a nice way of using the resources that we had ready at, to hand. I have a quote here that I'm not sure who by, oh yes, it was Gordon Vincent said uh, that John Hirsch dragged the Manitoba Theater Center kicking and screaming into the world of professional theater. What does he mean by that? Well, uh, because the uh, the people who were supposed supposed to be authorities on theater in Winnipeg at that time were all people who were connected with the amateur theater. And uh, the funny thing is, when I was a kid, there was in Winnipeg up till the early years of the war for about five years. Uh, I guess from 1937 to about 1941 when the draft took all the actors, there was a professional theater in the Dominion, uh, the John Holden Players. And they were sensational at promoting their stuff. Uh, the, uh, the production qualities were terrible. I mean, their idea of a big set change, you know, was to move a window from 
this side of the stage to that side of the stage, you know, for the next play, and repaint flats a different color. But uh, they were sensational promotion. I mean, you couldn't open a package of Quaker Oats or anything, your tea or whatever you bought, and out came a coupon, you know, good for 25 cents off your ticket at the John Holden Players. And I remember being taken by my parents to, to see shows there because, you know, it was a good deal. It only cost a dollar or something to get in, and you got 25 cents off, and it was cheaper for kids, and so on. That all st uh, stayed with me, that Winnebakers were susceptible to being given, you know, bargains and things like that, and, and talked, talked into things. But uh, a lot of the, uh, the revealed wisdom and the received wisdom in Winnipeg at that time was people like Frank Morris, who was a critic at the, uh, the uh, Winnipeg Free Press, very influential, and he was very wedded to the idea of amateur theater. That was the only thing that could really, really succeed. And then if we had a professional theater there, because people had tried, you see, to start professional enterprises there, and they'd always gone uh, right after the war and into the early 50s. So uh, he thought it would be such a setback, you know, when we crashed, I, never thinking that it would take root. And finally, it really did have to admit that he had been wrong. But a lot of the people, as I say, who were connected with theater and were, were people who gave their time and some money and whatnot to theater, did so for the little theater. And they totally rejected all John's notions that the way to do things better was to pay people to do it and, and make demands of them professionally, you know. So that was, uh, your success had to do with your approach, which was very professional. Right? Yeah, John insisted, you know, on minimum standards. And luckily, those are exactly what equity was there for. So we never had any problems with equity. They were a big help to, as far as I was concerned, actors' equity to us. Whatever happened to the D Dominion Theater? Uh, the Dominion, uh, we were there about three years and then I developed problems. It was one of these old buildings, you know, it was tied together by its roof. And I don't know, there was soil shifting there because of building construction nearby. And what happened was the roof became unstable. And so they had to come in and work most of a year building a new roof about seven or eight feet under the old roof because in those old buildings the walls were held together by the roof. They, you know, they, they weren't buttressed or anything like that. So uh, we had to move to the uh, Beacon Theater on Main Street, which was a dump. Oh gosh, was it ever awful uh, compared with the Dominion. How was it a dump? How was it a dump? I remember walking in when somebody said, well, you can go to the Beacon. I walk in and there's the theater and in the front lobby, somebody had written, fuck you, in letters eight feet high and I thought the theater is speaking to me. It was like, I dare you to succeed in this place. And we went into the dressing rooms. Oh, just absolute garbage cans. But we cleaned it up and went to work and people did come there and suffered it out and then went back to the Dominion. Well then, uh, when the Centennial Fever and everything came along, the big proposal was to make a kind of an arts concentration, you know, a big auditorium, and uh, the MTC was to be moved next door to the uh, existing theater, an old Pantages called the Playhouse, where we had all acted for the little theater, you know, and rehearsed uh, upstairs. So it was kind of, in a way, I, I was sad to see the move because the theater was very easy to, to produce in once we had acquired the, the property next door, you know, and hollowed it out to make studios for scenery and well, things like that. Well, on our opening night at the uh, Hatful of Rain, uh, I, uh, the board, I, uh, at our opening, I just wore a sweater or whatever, you know. And the board insisted that since I was the administrator of the Manitoba Theater Center, I had to wear a tux, tuxedo. Didn't have one. So I went to uh, our customer, Bernie Pauly. I said, Bernie, I want you to find me the oldest tux that we have in, in our wardrobe. People gave us old clothes, you see, for the theater. And he found one from 1935. The pants were this wide, the jacket came down to your navel or so. It was really 
horrendous in the little pointy lapels. I said, oh, beautiful, how much? Five bucks. So I bought it. Later on, I'm wearing it in East Berlin at the opera, and a guy comes up to me and says, ha, ah, you are from Argentina too. I said, I'm not from Argentina. Why do you think I'm from Argentina? He said, well, only in Buenos Aires have I seen sh lapels shaped thus. <laughs> they were so pointy. <laughs> but uh, so I wore this ancient tux all through for the whole five years that I was administrator there. <laughs> Yeah. We went to Carlton. They have a few good departments, including communications, but in uh, some of the departments they call it cartoon you. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, yeah. oh, don't, don't tell her that. Uh. <laughs> okay, I wonder if I can get this quickly out of you, if you remember this well, uh, the arrival of the Governor General Manier, there was a regular practice group. Oh, that was at the, uh, at the Beacon. Yeah, we were doing uh, uh, Tea House, not Tea House, the August moon was that, or maybe it was Mr. Roberts, maybe. No, I think it was Tea House of the August moon we were doing. All I remember there was a goat in it, so that could have been Mr. Roberts, but, uh, and we were all terrified that the uh, the goat would poop or something, you know, during the show, because Johnny had been using animals at Rainbow Stage, and we found out never use horses on stage, never use horses, they get scared and they poop everywhere inside. <laughs> Horrible people were skidding all over the place and real danger to dancers. But uh, they were coming well in Winnipeg. It was such a deal, you know, Vanier and Madame. And uh, well, I have a picture somewhere, I don't know where it is even, meeting him. You know, we all had to practice little bows from the neck down or up or whatever. And everybody was creaking and curtsying like mad. It was a big deal. And for the the Beacon Theater, I mean, it's, you know, artistic triumph before we went in there was the Beacon Melody Maids, which was an all-girl orchestra, which accompanied uh, terrible vaudeville acts, like people who had failed in vaudeville in the States came up and played. <laughs> but it was live entertainment, so we used to go. <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was uh, good for us that they did decide to come to the, uh, the Beacon because they came fairly early in the season and that kind of established that it was okay for people to go there because it was in a tough part of town, like just around the corner from the police station and you had to be careful. We did uh, there, we did Valpone, we did uh, Look Back in Anger. I think this was Tea House of the August Moon, something like that. There was a big spate, you know, of things from the Pacific at, at that time as part of the reconciliation with Japan and everything that was going on. And um, these things were very, very popular. That and, uh, and uh, the King of Siam, King and I, at Rainbow. John used fireworks during uh, his uh, finale and a curtain call on that, you know, and I said to him, and it went on for about 15 minutes. It was up till I finally saw uh, Lindsay Kemp's production of Midsummer Night's Dream in Madrid, which had a half hour curtain call. It was the longest curtain call I've seen. I said, I have seen people do cheap things during a curtain call, Johnny, but setting off fireworks has got to be the lowest. <laughs> to get a standing ovation. Yeah. School tours. It was a, all an accident. We didn't know about it, but in, in Vancouver, uh, people like Joy Coggill and whatnot were doing school tours. And I think that a theater in Edmonton, some kind of a theater organization, was doing a playground theater and some kind of school tours. We didn't even know about it because communication was terrible in those days. And uh, we hadn't thought of touring the schools or anything like that, but in our, I guess our th second year or third year, uh, we, we had enough budget to, to uh, hire a couple of professional actors to come and be on staff the whole time. Uh, that was uh, Martin, instead of bringing in people show by show, Martin Lager and Peter Mannering. And uh, inevitably there came a week when they weren't rehearsing, they weren't playing, they had nothing to do, and I resented bitterly having to pay them the 85 bucks or whatever they got for the week, and it would glare at them when I saw them. And, and Peter Mannering and Martin knew some guy who was a teacher in my old 
uh, high school, Nelson McIntyre High School out in St. Boniface in Norwood. So uh, they arranged for the two of them to go and do scenes from Shakespeare at this guy's school. And they said, that, okay, I said, sure, great, but make sure the Mantle Theater Center gets a credit because it'll look good on a record. Well, all of a sudden, uh, that day, practically, I get a call from Gordon Bell High School, which was in another part of town, saying, uh, asking me if uh, Gordon Bell could be included in our tour. I said, because we were planning a tour, but not of this, you see, a tour of Manitoba. And uh, I said, what, this tour? Uh, the Shakespeare tour to schools. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, when would you like to have them? It's not going on too long now, you know, you're coming to us kind of late. And the guy says, well, uh, what about uh, tomorrow morning? I said, oh, oh, my, I just happen to have a slot on. Uh, yeah, we'll do it tomorrow morning. When do you want them? Where should they be? And all. He says, by the way, what's the name of the tour? And I said, oh, uh, oh we call it Shakespeare Goes to School. And the guy says, oh, that's catchy. Great. Okay. And so I phone up Peter Mannering and Martin. Martin, do you know where Gordon Bell High School? No. Well, here's how to get there. Be there tomorrow morning at 10 and ask for Mr. Johnson or something. And do your stuff. We're going to see if we can get you into a couple more schools. So at that point, then, we uh, went to the school board and said, we've done this trial tour. People like it. We got invitations to go here and there. We want to put it on a proper professional basis. And they gave us enough money to have, I guess we had about four people in the company. We had very high quality company. Martha Henry, Donnelly Rhodes, people like Lynn Carew, uh, Eric Duncan. Really, you know, first class people. And uh, they did Shakespeare Goes to School for a while, and then uh, we developed in a second tour called The Moderns Go to School, which was Chekhov and Shaw and things like that. And then later on we discovered that somebody else had already been doing it. We thought we'd invented the whole thing, but uh, it, it was a wheel that was already rolling out in Vancouver. Was a natural. Uh, Gordon Pinson at one point said that you were always snapping your fingers in the wings. That was Johnny. John, yeah. Faster and louder, you know, <laughs> all the time. That was him. He would, he would stand either in the wings. In fact, once in a show I was in that John directed uh, called uh, The Time of Your Life, he was backstage directing through the flat and an actor who wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing, and the stage manager, George Heffelfinger, a very big, strong guy, picked John up and carried him off the stage and dropped him, you know, <laughs> into the alley behind the theater. <laughs> Which was his perfect right to do. But John would either stand in the wings and, and pick up the pace, or at the back of the theater you could hear him. Always. You know, he was Mr. Worrywart when it came to uh, pace. Always afraid people would get bored, you know. That's just one element of his style. Could you further round out and explain uh, John Hirsch's directing style? Well, he was, uh, he didn't always get a chance to do it. It, it was a funny mixture because he loved to do very flamboyant things. And uh, he had a, we had a great success with a play called Dark of the Moon. Not a terrific script, but uh, John fell in love with the show. It had songs in it, which he liked. And Marty was very good. He played the lead, the witch boy. And uh, we had some excellent other people in the cast. And uh, a wonderful set. Claire, hmm, forgotten. Uh, English designer who came to work with us. Uh, but his favorite. Uh, playwright was Chekhov, you know, which is sort of the absolute far end of from flamboyant. Uh, I think his flamboyant side uh, was why he loved to do things like um, musicals, because there you had a lot of resources, you know, pretty girls and jugglers and whatever you wanted, and music and lots of sets and jazz and. Uh, 
And, and things like ACDC that he did down in New York. Uh, Heathcote Williams was playing, which he got an Obie for, which was a very, very difficult but very flamboyant show. Uh, the, at one point when the MTC was evolving, you were flip, faced the difficulty of dropping some long-term performers who weren't really making the grade. Uh, did, how did this, how did the company do? Well, uh, part of the problem naturally was it wasn't strictly a matter of, of being able to cut the mustard, uh, you know, in, in sheer ability terms, but quite often it was people had a job and they did not want to quit it. And uh, they, uh, our problem was that we were doing maybe eight, 10, 12 shows a year, and we had to have people there all the time. And we particularly ran into this on the technical side because we had, for example, with Theater 77, we had a wonderful set designer, Ted Carl, who was a teacher. But Ted did not want, quite rightly, didn't want to leave teaching, and he couldn't always arrange to have his holidays. When we worked at Rainbow, we used Ted a lot because he, he got the summer off from school. But in the winter, he couldn't always arrange holidays to be able to do shows and whatnot. And uh, there was a lot of feeling, I think, that we were kind of ungrateful toward the people who had really helped us get going. But we made everybody like that, usually the same deal, namely, if you're willing to, you know, be available, we will use you more. But uh, we can't guarantee to give you what you're making out of being a pickle salesman or whatever it is they did to earn a living. The second stage, we've already talked about, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, it was basically, we, we started out renting a space in a warehouse and then some spy would turn us into the cops and they'd close us down and we'd find another warehouse and open up the game. It was like being a bootlegger or something. Then finally, uh, some, uh, there was a legion that was next door to us where the theater was in the next building and they moved away and they had a big, big room that they used for meetings and which was susceptible to, you know, to making a kind of a three-quarter round theater. So we set up a small theater there with maybe, I don't know, 150 seats to do new, new, new stuff pretty well. Um, That's where Marty and Jack and Adrian and everybody did their stuff. Sadly, we don't have the opportunity to speak to Kate Reed about her career. She worked at the MTC. Can you tell me a bit about your memories of her? Oh. Kate. <laughs> I was at the Canadian Theatre Centre when she was contracted to go out and do uh, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which she had done uh, the matinee company on Broadway with uh, Don Davis. And uh, Don was all signed up and Kate was always a terrible procrastinator about uh, sending in her contract. When Johnny finally phoned me, he says, Kate's supposed to be here in 10 days. I don't have a contract. I'm terrified she'll get a movie offer or something like that. And uh, she will uh, not come out here. She'll find some excuse. Could you please go get her to sign her contract? So I'll, I go over to Kate's, and there's, a, as usual, big party going on. Louis Negan's there. Everybody's there. Big whoop de doo going on. And I say to Kate, Kate, I'm here to uh, uh, get you to sign your contract. John Hirsch is all worried. Oh, he knows I'll be there. And I say, well, that's why they have contracts, Kate, so people sort of, you know, can be quite certain that you mean what you say. And so how about signing the contract? And John had said to me, she'll use every trick in the book not to sign the contract. So I was well prepared. So, well, first of all, have a drink, dear. And then we'll see about this contract. So I have a drink. Then um, I say, Kate, let's go upstairs and sign the contract. So we go up there, she says, oh, what's the point of doing this? I don't have pen in that. I was like, I have a pen. Oh. So then she uh, signs all the contracts. I say, good, didn't hurt a bit, did it, Kate? Well, no, but what's the point of doing this? I don't have an envelope. I, say, I have an envelope, all addressed. Well, I don't have any stamps. I said, it's stamped. <laughs> she said, you rat. <laughs> I said, uh, she said, well, I'm not going out. I won't mail it today. I'll give it to me. I'll mail it on the way home. <laughs> but she was such a terrific performer that it was easy to forgive, you know, such people for being a little bit cuckoo birds. <laughs>
And how would you describe her? Yeah. Kate, Kate Reed, uh, yes, that was a good anecdote about her. Um, can you describe her as a, as a performer? And a Kate? <coughs> That's a, a alarm saying that it's alive. Uh, Kate was, uh, oh, she was one of these people with big resources that seemed to be almost hidden when you talk to her of a very strong naked emotion. You know, I mean, a role like that role in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, that was perfect for her because all this vitriol and everything could come rolling right out. She was, uh, but I, I don't want to make it sound as though she was some kind of a, you know, ham eating up the scenery. She wasn't that kind of an actor. She was very controlled as an actor. And, um, but she, all I remember is how, when I did see her perform, how, how powerful she was, you know. It was just bang, big direct connection with the audience. This book, by the way, Gordon Pinson described 77 and MTC as uh, the most thrilling time he spent in theater. What image do you have of Gordon Pinson? Of oh, Gordy? Well, he was, uh, he's, you know, one of the most likable people in the world. And uh, he has a lot of ability. And he loves to be helpful. I mean, he, uh, well, we had a lot of difficulties on that production of, uh, of uh, Death of a Salesman. Our, our, one of our leads quit two, three weeks before the show. And we had to get in another guy who turned out to be terrific. Gordy played opposite the guy who left. And he worked really hard with, uh, with the replacement actor to bring him up to speed. He's that kind of guy, a very generous guy. And also, when we, uh, our usual uh, poster designer was out of town, we needed a poster. Gordy says, I, I can do that. So he designed a couple of posters for us. He was a graphic artist, you see. He had been a paratrooper. And I guess if you've been a paratrooper, you're so grateful to be alive that <laughs> you turn into a saint. <laughs> in a thumbnail, I guess everything's in a thumbnail from now on. Uh, there was cooperative productions with Shaw, Stratford, and Théâtre Nouveau Monde. How did, how did that come about? Uh, a lot of it because uh, Stratford was the original inspiration to all of us that it, things could happen in Canada and people could actually make a living from theater. Up till then, the only professional theater to speak of was uh, quite a bit of uh, summer stock in Ontario. And the odd thing like Rainbow Stage where some professional work was done, but it was upsy downsy and usually, you know, threatened with extinction because the city produced it in those days. Uh, and then Stratford came along, gee, they not only uh, made it work, but they captured the imagination of the New York critics and everything and they did stuff that was obviously first class on very difficult material. I mean, Shakespeare is not easy. So that was a kind of a, a big inspiration to us. And we began going there. Uh, John and I went for the first time because uh, a, a conference was, uh, was arranged there to discuss setting up the National Theater School back in around, I don't know, around 59. It was during the summer, we were producing Guys and Dolls at uh, Rainbow, and it was going very well, so we felt we could escape for a weekend. So he and I went down there and to, uh, to see uh, Othello, and Orpheus in the Underworld was on at the Avon. John was too pooped to, uh, in those days, you know, propeller didn't planes, he flew all night. And when you got off, you felt like a spark plug or something <laughs> from hearing the motors change every few minutes. So he was too pooped to go to the evening show, but we did go and see uh, Othello in the afternoon, and we went to this uh, meeting to found the National Theatre School, which was a very cooperative thing between the people who were in the French profession and in the, on the English side. The French, at that point, were more advanced than we were. Uh, Nouveau Monde was going. Uh, they had, uh, they were very, very popular on television 
a lot of the people like Jean Louis Roux, they were big stars. I mean, you couldn't walk down the street in Montreal with a, you get stopped every two minutes for autographs with Jean Louis and Jean Gascon. And uh, so, uh, but they did come and lend their prestige to getting the school going, which was a co-lingual school, you know, French and English. Uh, Michel Saint-Denis was the sort of guiding spirit. And they had uh, Jean as a kind of artistic director at that point, and Powis Thomas came in on the English side, a wonderful, wonderful Welsh actor and teacher. Uh, Jimmy Donville was the first uh, manager. He had uh, started by being a producer with a big tour that went across the country. Yeah, that was something that was very good. It was not a professional tour, but it was professional by the time it came to Winnipeg. It was called My Fur Lady. It was by the McGill uh, um, students. And it had been put together by Galt McDermott, who wrote Hair, and uh, Jimmy Donville, who went on to be the founding manager of the school. Uh, Tim Porteous, who was head of the Canada Council and Trudeau's speechwriter. Brian McDonald was the choreographer, and they were all going to McGill at that time. You know, so it was a little like Hart House here in Toronto. It was a kind of a magnet for uh, English-speaking talent, that McGill Review. It was very, very popular. So at that point, we got to know a lot of these people that we'd heard about from a distance, you know. but. Uh, didn't really know and uh, we formed an, an alliance with them that when subsidies started in earnest we would work together and so that they when we got a favor from Canada Council we would tip off the Quebec guys so that they could go and yell favoritism and get a favor and then we'd yell favoritism and get a favor and we played off anybody who had some money against the other to build up the resources as quickly as possible and uh, people like John Jimmy Donville was a brilliant, brilliant man, and he saw that the way to make the school successful was to have the, uh, the uh, students taught to as much as possible by their eventual employers. So he went out and browbeat people like John into going and teaching at the school. And at school, John got to know Jean Gascon, saw his production of, uh, you know, a Three Penny Opera. And, all kinds of familiar and everything, which was really first-class stuff, and much in advance of anything apart from Stratford. It was kind of like the equivalent of Stratford and did mostly classical plays or modern classics like uh, Three Penny Opera. Uh, and the funny thing was uh, I started getting interested in Canadian plays when Jimmy Donville went to the TNM and he said, we can't do as many classics as we want to. I said, why? He said, well, we have to put on Quebec plays if we want to make money. This was an eye-opener in those days, because here the conventional wisdom was that uh, original work by writers in English Canada was poison. You would eventually be the Secretary General for Canadian Theatre Science. I was there from 58 uh, until, uh, no, from 60, Three, the very end of 63, I left Game Players, went there, and I worked there until, the, I think January of 69, I went to Stratford then. They were stuck because the writer had bombed out on Satyricon, so I went there and wrote Satyricon for them at that point. You worked with the people from across the country? Kind of bird? Oh yeah, our board, that was the strength of the CTC. Our board was made up of uh, unions, you know, like Union des Artistes and uh, Equity and ACTRA and uh, all the uh, the major, well, all the only <laughs> producing theaters. And uh, as we expanded our programs and the Canada Council got more generous in the Centennial Commission, then we, uh, we loaned out our consultants then to other people uh, such as uh, we helped the Vancouver Symphony build up the largest subscription in the world back in the uh, in early mid 60s. Danny Newman went out and worked with them and they did a wonderful job out there. 
Uh, so they, we, he worked with not only symphony orchestras, but uh, ballet companies, opera companies, and all our theaters as well. We kept him very busy about half his time. And that was our probably most uh, single most effective program. But we did a whole lot of other things. We uh, uh, financed uh, internships, you know, for people who were uh, ambitious to become managers, to go and work with high class managers and discover what it was like and so on. And uh, we had a million things. We published plays. We published. We were first people to publish George Regas' uh, Ecstasy of Rita Joe, and. Uh, Jamie Rainey's uh, play, uh, Colors in the Dark. Uh, we never produced any uh, in plays in French because the Canada Council was, at that point, was nervous about separatism. They wanted to read them before we published them, and we said, no, we wouldn't do that because that was censorship. It was a tour in several provinces. The, uh, we, uh, at the, uh, can Canadian players, uh, while I was there, we produced an original that uh, began as a script by Len Peterson and then gradually evolved into a kind of Brechtian review. It was called All About Us. And there I did a lot of, of reworking of material that Len had submitted. And we eventually wound up being sort of reluctant co authors on it. It was produced in conjunction with Manitoba Theatre Center in 1964 by the Canadian Players Foundation. And it toured west to Victoria and east to Halifax, and then wound up playing in the Royal Alex. And it was the first uh, dramatic production to be shown on CTV. You had a satiric radio show in the, s in the 50s? I worked on one. Uh, which was called Spoken in Jest, and Gordy was to be one of the company. And it never did go anywhere uh, because, uh, apart from anything else, I got all involved with the theater and I didn't have any time. But more than anything else, uh, we had a terrific, ideal leading lady, Wendy Hicks, and her husband got transferred to Ottawa. And we, we auditioned all kinds of people to take Wendy's place. And we finally decided it was better not to do it if we couldn't do it. Because it had been tailored, you see, for certain people like Gordy and, uh, and Wendy. And there were three or four people in. Uh, you wrote a children's play, Trap? Trap, we did, yeah. Uh, at the theater center, Len Andre, Len Cariou. Um, people said you had to be named Len to get anywhere in theater. And Len Peterson. And Grant Cowan who later made a fortune playing Snoopy. A lot of people began there because for one main reason, that was the only game in town. Uh, apart from anything, once the crest went under, you know, in the mid-60s, then uh, the MTC was there as a very well-established organization which could survive transitions of, you know, going from one artistic director to another. In a lot of theaters, they, they never do survive losing their founder or losing a strong personality. Who were the big players in CBC one drama? Minute, Who were the big people? Big players in CBC drama in one minute. In uh, the big people that I remembered were S.E. Young. He was a producer and he had produced in Winnipeg and then went to Toronto. And Andrew Allen was like Marshall McLuhan, like a godlike guy. And uh, then after that it was <clears throat> the writers. They had a wonderful group of writers. And after that, they had the best radio actors in the world. The best. Even off tape, I'll give you an example. Dougie uh, Rain uh, trained in that school, right? And when he was hired to play Howe in 2001, they gave him like a three-week contract or something to record the voice under. So Dougie, you know, prepared as he would for an El Cheapo CBC production with him. Nothing much in the way of rehearsal time. Uh, went to, in Montreal to meet with uh, Kubrick. Did it all in the morning. Collected his three-week movie salary. So thanks very much. You know, that's the kind of quality. That they had a fantastic group of people. There was a man named John Draney who was like the ultimate radio actor. He was, could do no wrong. He was amazing. Amazing guy. 
have another legendary figure. Um, we're right on four o'clock now. Right? Yeah. Oh, well. That's it. That's, that's all we got. Well, that's sure. it. Well, if you need more, we can do something by phone or something. Yeah, <laughs> or if, if there's factual material, I can just well, do a know, tape and send it to you. Well, the thing was, you know, if when you're yeah. living out there. <laughs> Let's hold for a second. Tape rolling. Okay. Okay. I understand that uh, you made people feel welcome in, in Winnipeg in the theater community. Um, can you tell me a bit about that extra role? Yeah, well, uh, when when artists came in, not only actors, but directors and designers and other people, uh, we, uh, I mean, let's face it, they were there, they didn't know anybody, and uh, we had a lot of people who were longtime theater goers who were just loved actors and designers and people like that. And then we had other people who were new to the audience. And so we used to ask people in the audience if they would like to volunteer to invite some of these people to their homes for dinner. You know, particularly if there was something like Thanksgiving on or something like that, you know, where normally people would be out going out with their friends. And uh, we also involved them to the extent that they would could spare the time in uh, giving lectures and lessons to our uh, the people in our school for the audience. And we made all of the actors feel that for us, which, and it was true, it was a big event having them there. I mean, when we had Dougie Rain up there, and he's from Winnipeg, and so Caldwell, uh, we made them feel that we really appreciated the fact that they were out there working for what they're working for, which was nothing like what they could normally earn, you know. So uh, I think that was what what was about it. And as far as Gordy thinking, you know, how thrilling it was, it was thrilling because you definitely had the feeling that uh, what well, something was happening, something positive was happening, and you were largely responsible. We did our best to uh, make a lot of. Uh, complicity built into the whole thing, you know. We were all members of suspects in the same crime. <laughs> what do they mean by the Golden Triangle? Well, I mean, you can tell what the heck is that? Well, I think it was because there were strong people in, in command of theaters in Montreal and Stratford and uh, out in Winnipeg. There was Michael Langham at Stratford, who was a number one, still is. There was Johnny out in Winnipeg. And uh, in uh, Montreal, you had two or three terrific people. You've had Brand Namour, Jean Louis Rowe, Jean Gascon, and uh, they provided a kind of directorial solidity and, and a kind of feeling of uh, momentum and continuity, you know, because you could see Michael's work developing over the years as he explored this way of doing Shakespeare, and, you know, there was a kind of uh, shape to the careers that those people had. We're already familiar with the Dominion Drama Festival, but can you specifically say how would it have affected the evolution of prof professional stage? Uh, well, apart from anything else, what it did was make us aware of uh, standards which were considerably higher than our own standards in other parts of the country. Usually stuff from Montreal. There was, uh, I've forgotten, I remember La Tour Eiffel qui tue, which was a, a farce, a crazy farce. And they did it beautifully. I forget which theater it was. It was, oh, it was um, the guy who eventually founded the uh, Katsu in, uh, in Montreal. Brilliant production. And it was the kind of thing Johnny had talked about doing but we had never been able to convince people that that was the way to do uh, theater, you know, to not have flats, but to do everything with uh, umbrellas. And uh, they used uh, clothes dryers, you know, stretched to different heights, to look like the Eiffel Tower or whatever. Brilliant stuff. So I think that that was at a time when communication was the bits and there was practically nothing in the way of any, product, any publications about the theater. They actually did uh, make us aware of what was happening, and some of it was pretty good stuff. In a sentence, can you tell me the the comment on the thesis that the regional theaters like the MTC caused the demise of the DTF? 
I don't think so. I think that <clears throat> it was something that had had its time, and uh, what had happened was that the uh, non-professional theater was evolving in a different direction and away from competition. And once you took the competition out of it, then a lot of the support for it kind of began, uh, you know, drying up. Uh, I don't think so. Everybody said in Winnipeg, and certainly for a few years after we began the theater, uh, not professional activity went down to almost zip, except in French. But then what happened was now there's more theater in Winnipeg than there ever was. And there's a number of professional companies, a whole bunch of non-professional companies. And uh, this is what we predicted would happen, that there would be a kind of, you know, nervous breakdown because of the shock of our arrival on the horizon. And then people would adjust to that and would come back because that then they had a place to go and aim for, you know, as performers. That they, if they got good enough, they could get hired. As a precy, could you answer this? There's a little tiny graph in a dictionary, 15 miles, critically successful, done out west and in Toronto. Um, you wrote it. It was uh, originally on CBC. Uh, as a 90-minute uh, teleplay, and uh, then Martin Kinch here in Toronto asked me if I would adapt it. In 69, when I was at Stratford, he had a little theater there called the Canadian Place Theater. So I said, yes, I would. It was unpaid, but I said, what the hey? And so I did it, and it was the first full-length play, to my knowledge, done in Toronto by a director who became part of the new wave, you know, like Martin, there was Martin, John Palmer, uh, Paul Thompson, Ken Gass, a few like that. And to my knowledge, it was the first full-length Canadian play, new play, that was done here in Toronto, and we won the Governor General's medal for it, and we also uh, got a terrific review from mean Nathan Cohen. So that really everybody goes, well, this must be pretty good if Nathan Cohen likes it. <laughs> I guess the background of Len, of All About Us, Len Peterson, how did he contribute, how much to the Canadian stage? Len? Uh, well, he was known, you know, mostly as a, 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 um, a radio writer and a wonderful radio writer he was. He did numbers of plays on stage here with things like the Mercury Theater and whatnot, but those things did not continue. They came and went, and they were mostly based on the content of the CBC employed writing community, acting community, and so on. Uh, he accepted a commission from us at Manitoba Theater Center and he wrote for us a musical with Morris Certain called Look Ahead, which we played and which was very successful, and we held it over and it proved to be a very good season closer for us. It was something that John really wanted to do, and he did a good job on it. And uh, so it was, uh, you know, it, 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 I don't know if it ever got any more productions, but uh, the thing was that uh, Glenn was willing to come and write a play for us for not much. That's what it came down to, because even at 10% of box, it wasn't that much, you know. But he was just dying to express himself any way he could. Colloquium 67. That was, a, uh, I think, a very important meeting, because what happened was we, uh, we organized during Expo, this thing which is supposed to have 200 people from all over the world, 600 showed up. We oversold it. Judith was our communications and marketing person and she overdid it. Uh, but <clears throat> the very important thing was we had tip-top people, Kenneth Tynan and Arnold Wesker and uh, uh, people of that quality from France, Germany, East Germany, Russia, Stanagov, from Israel, from all over the place came in from the theater and tip-top architects and designers. Sean Kenny, the guy who did the original designs for uh, Oliver and things like that. And what they were all talking about was how there was a crying need all over the world for empty spaces, for things like TV studios, neutral spaces that you could make into whatever you wanted that would suit the needs of the material. 
And uh, at the Colloquium 67, the whole uh, uh, French and English uh, class came to the colloquium. And a whole lot of the young directors and actors and went, and from Toronto came and from Montreal. And uh, among them were people like Paul Thompson and Ken Gass and Martin and so on, and Palmer, who went on then to, to associate themselves with what became known as the alternate theaters uh, because they were exactly what they had talked about with Ken Tynan and Jersey Grotowski and all the people they met face to face at this colloquium, you see. So, uh, I mean, let's face it, even now, we Canadians are very unsure about their uh, taste and their judgment artistically. So it means a lot when somebody like Grotowski, who was a big, huge name on, in, as a theoretician of theater, comes and says, here's what I think is going to happen, here's what I'm doing, and here's you know, what you could think of doing here, because if you're going to do new work, you've got to work in somewhere cheap. You've got to get a small place that isn't expensive to run and find a way to do it for very little. Because there is a rule that uh, I guess Sean Kenny laid down, uh, plays start in small theaters plays get remounted in bigger theaters and big successes get remounted in even bigger theaters. But in the main, things start out, you know, small. Your time is virtually up, but I, I okay. was, uh, told you, Sarah Jujaka, is there a very quick Sarah? I think I hate, I uh, she came to Winnipeg uh, for our first year when we were running the two separate series and she did the little theater series very fine uh, a director and particularly good acting coach. And she complained every day about how awful Winnipeg was. So I thought, and she used to say, oh, now you see where I live, it looks like Tel Aviv after an air raid on me. It's terrible, it's awful, I'm holes. And mm -mm, uh, I haven't been like it here. So we started looking for somebody to replace her because we figured she wanted to go back to New York. And she came and she said, you're not asking me back, darling. And I said, no, you hate it here. Well, I know, she said, but I hate it everywhere, darling. <laughs> like a person in Chekhov. <laughs> That's why I'm so good with Chekhov. <laughs> I think I said it. Any gaping, gaping, gaping uh, holes that I've left? Huh? Any gaping holes that I left in that? Uh, Probably all of them. I don't know, but I if there are any, I can, we can talk by phone and give some stuff by phone or whatever, do a voiceover. Yeah, no sweat. Well, we'll be doing